Hi, welcome to Health Educated, Keeping It 100. I am your host, Dr. Kristen Ball Motley. Um, so as you know, our show premiered last week, last Wednesday evening, and it was a really good show. And people enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it, and I was thinking about doing it once every other week in the evening. But we decided to keep the party going. So we're going to be on here every week, Wednesdays during the lunch break. So I could take a lunch break. Y'all can take a lunch break, come through and live a little healthier life. Um, so today we are going to be talking about um, the test and treat program that President Biden announced at the State of the Union, State of the Union address last week. Um, he said that he's going to be launching this program where you can go get tested for COVID at a local pharmacy and get a COVID pill if you test positive. This is what he's calling the test and treat model. Um, and the drug that you would get is called Paxlovid. It's made by Pfizer and it's been shown to be about 89% effective in keeping high risk people from developing severe COVID um, and death as long as it's given within five days of having the symptoms. Now, this drug is approved through an EUA, an emergency use authorization, which we mostly heard about when the COVID vaccines became available. These are governed by the FDA and they are issued when there is an urgent need to treat um, or to test um, a health condition like COVID. Um, and they need to get this approved and through before the FDA has time to do a full review of the data available. Um, a full re review usually takes months to complete. And with diseases like COVID, we just don't have that time. So the EUA is approved for the, vac for the vaccines, although um, Pfizer's vaccine has been fully approved, um, but the Moderna and the Johnson and Johnson are still both operating through the EUA. And this new pill that is available is also um, available through an EUA. So um, I have a special guest. I'm going to always have a special guest because I don't know everything. And so I'm always going to lean on my friends and my colleagues who are in the top of their field to come on and help to educate me and to help educate you on whatever topic we're discussing. So I'm bringing in Dr. Renee Jones. She's a pharmacist and the director of pharmacy and case management at Personal Physician Care based in South Florida. Um, most importantly, she is my best friend from FAMU. We went to college together. So I know what she knows. She knows what I know. Um, and she was actually my uh, tutor in, in, in school, too. She's really, really, really smart. So when I came up with this topic, um, I knew she would be perfect because she travels around the country educating pharmacists on the new drugs for that year. So I couldn't think of anyone better to lead us through this conversation. Um, I also want to mention that Dr. Justin Foster, he is behind the scenes with us, helping us to find answers and information if y'all ask some really, really hard questions. So he'll be he'll be behind the scenes today. Um, but hi, Ren. Hi. Hello, Dr. Motley. How are you? <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for um, having me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you know, I called you last week, um, asked you to come on so that we can talk about this. I can learn about it and we can educate our people um, because they have a decision to make now. So people that yeah. haven't been vaccinated, um, they it, if they test positive, they may want to do this, uh, take this new drug that's available. So let's talk about it a little bit. Paxlovid. What kind of medicine is it? What does it do? Like, how does it work? Um, well, Paxlovid is actually a medication that stops the virus from being able to replicate. Um, and so if it can't replicate, then it can't cause severe or mild infections. It actually is two medications in one pill. Oh, actually two medications given in three pills. I apologize. And so you have to take three pills by mouth twice a day for five days. 
So it stops the virus from replicating. Okay. Um, so I guess my next question would be, so who's like the, the ideal person? I mean, I imagine I'm young and healthy. And if I test positive for COVID, I don't have any coexisting diseases. Um, so like, is there, um, uh, is this something for just say anyone who tests positive for COVID or how does it work? I understand. So actually, when they were first studying this medication, Paclovid, um, they only used it in patients that were not previously vaccinated and did not have COVID in the past. So that's number one. Number two, all of the patients had to have at least one chronic disease, whether that could be diabetes, anything uh, related to the heart, you know, congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation. Um, multiple disease states. Um, but if you look along the package insert um, for these patients that they tested it on, um, they could have a mechanical device, et cetera, or they could just be over 60 years of age without a chronic disease. So in your instance, they really didn't test it on you because you're less than 60 and you're a healthy adult. They have approved it, however, for pediatric patients greater than 12 years of age and weighing at least 88, 90 pounds. Um, however, it is important to note for those of you that have children, um, if you have not vaccinated your, your child and you are considering this medication for your 12, 13 year old child, please know that they have not studied it in the pediatric population. It was only studied in patients greater than 18 years of age. And what they've done is they're speculating that based on age, weight, height, um, patients that are greater than 12 years of age or 90 pounds should react, respond to the medication just like adults. Wait a minute. That was a lot. Yes, so it was. So let me go back. <laughs> it was study in people who have never had COVID and yes. who are not vaccinated. Correct. And only in adults who or 18 years and older. Correct. Again, 18 to 59, they had one comorbidity, one chronic disease. Um, even if they were a smoker, even if they had high blood pressure, they were allowed to be studied. But once they had 60 years of age, they didn't have to have anything and they were studied as well. Oh, okay. So as long as they were over 60, they didn't have to have a comorbidity. Correct. Which is unlikely nowadays, unfortunately. That's true. Again, yeah. because they said high blood pressure, um, that kind of is like most of our population nowadays, diabetes. If you're overweight, they included that as a chronic disease to allow you to be a part of the trial. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if they didn't study it, I, if they didn't include, I mean, how could it be an EUA for 12 to 17 if it wasn't studied in that population. I would imagine they must have had some data, right? Yeah, for approval, they did not. Um, that's not to say that studies aren't going on at this moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for uh, emergency use of medications, Normally, we would never do that, especially with our children. Um, we make sure that the medication has been studied. Even with um, the COVID vaccine, there was um, studies ongoing with children, real-time studies, obviously, um, before they allowed it to be used in the general population. But because it's an emergency use um, medication, they did approve it just based on how adults and children of that age um, metabolize or excrete that these particular medications, but no, it has not been studied in children. That's very interesting. Well, we don't yes, have the data is. yet. So hopefully they get that data out soon just to make sure um, that it really is as safe and effective yeah. as they um, anticipate it to be. All yes. right, so it sounds like they're looking for people who are at high risk for having hospitalization well, so um, technically that's how the vaccine started. They were targeting the elderly people that had um, these chronic diseases that could, that their body wouldn't be able to really um, handle having COVID. Um, but now um, they are not what we consider 
detrimental chronic diseases, I'm not going to look at someone that has high blood pressure, but they take their medications every day. So their blood pressure is now normal. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't be someone that I would be considering an at risk patient, but it is still a chronic disease mm -hmm. that people have. It is a silent killer. So they kind of included everything except for like mental health. Um, to be honest with you, mm. you're an active smoker, um, sickle cell disease is prominent in the African American community. Mm -hmm. um, overweight, obviously, is a prominent in our community. So that's who they targeted. Okay. And again, these are, they also included people who have not yet been vaccinated. So Correct. is it only supposed to be used in people that have no. been vaccinated? Anyone can use it, but okay. that's what this initial study focused on. Okay. There's no data yet on if it's superior, the same, or anything once you have COVID. Okay. Now, how long has this drug been studied? Because a lot of the controversy around the COVID-19 vaccines, we know when it first came out, it was new. And I wasn't trying to get it. And I know <laughs> you wasn't trying to get it. Nope. <laughs> so what pharmacist? Wait this out. We'll see what happens. Cause this That's is exactly what we said on the phone. We're going to yeah. see what happens to everybody else. <laughs> and then we'll make a decision. And that's funny coming from two pharmacists because I had most of my physicians in the office, you know, that like, you still haven't gotten it. You still haven't gotten it. But, you know, sometimes there's a scenario where you know too much. Um, so we kind of just wanted to see what was going to happen with this medication. Um, we're going to have to see what happens because it was just actually um brought on to research in about June 2000, excuse me, by June 2020, um, that's when it was um, began the studies. So it hasn't even been a full two years yet, and not to persuade you or dissuade you from taking um, Paclovid, but to just let you know that most of the time it takes quite some years for us to study um, medications. We study them um, from the kinetic standpoint, we, meaning we study, um, you know, how is this medication chemically formulated? Then we go on to rats. Then we go on to human trials for people that are normally healthy um, just to see if it's safe. And then we go on to our trials to see if it's effective, if it actually works. So when uh, Dr. Motley mentioned that there was an emergency approval for this drug, um, what we're saying is we're kind of bypassing all those years and steps um, and tangling it all up into like one trial with humans. Let's see if it works. Let's see if it doesn't. Let's see if it's safe. Let's see if it's not. And they did that in about 2,200 patients. Many clinical trials that you see for medications that are not being used for emergency use, you have trials of like 10,000, 20,000 patients or more. This particular trial only had 2,200 patients in it, which is not a lot compared to the millions of Americans living in the U.S. So we're going to have to wait and see. Definitely. So I want to back up again. Um, you said two two important things. So one is this drug was discovered, I guess, about a year and a half ago. Um, and so that means it really is like new, 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 <laughs> new, new. When we're talking about the vaccines and mm -hmm. using the mRNA technology, I think that the media did a lot to call it new, which scared people like us. Yeah. Like, I don't want no new drug. I don't want no new vaccine. I don't want no new nothing. But what we actually had to learn about was that the technology that was used for that vaccine was not new. It was a new vaccine for COVID because COVID was a new disease, but the mRNA technology that was used to create the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine was actually not new. It had been studied for decades. And so learning that helped to bring comfort to me. Yeah. How about you? Um, it actually did. When I found out about the um, mRNA vaccine and how long they've been studying it, I was to be honest, happy that that research had been going on for so long so yeah. that I could feel more comfortable um, taking this medication, this mm -hmm. vaccination mm -hmm. compared to a vaccine that was just, you know, invented, mm -hmm. you know, two years ago. And people are right to have that, that concern because mm -hmm. it is a vaccine. It is injected into you. Um, it is altering the way your body is perceiving, you know, new viruses. That's why you have this antibody effect so it can fight it. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people feel comfortable taking pills 
um, because they have a denotion if I take it, it'll go out faster, I won't have any long-term effects. So there's both sides of um, the coin with comfortability, but don't forget all these medications also have um, side effects that we want to make sure, or at least we're aware of um, before taking um, these medications. That's 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 a big deal, and and we're going to get to the side effects as well. I just want to mention that Justin found some information about um, COVID, um, about Pfizer starting trials for the Paxlovid um, in six to seventeen year old patients, um, and it looks like they have one study that has one hundred and forty patients, um, pediatric patients between the ages of six and 17 so far. So they're looking at the data, which is really important, but I like to see the results of the data. Yeah. Lots of it. A lot. <laughs> because especially for those of us that have kids, you know, um, yeah. personally, I had vaccinated my 16 year old son um, before I even got vaccinated. And the reason was because he was just diagnosed with type one diabetes in May. Um, it was a scary situation. He was in the ICU. And I chose to have my son vaccinated immediately after we were discharged because COVID is real. Um, and even now you have um, various states that are releasing the laws or you know removing the laws that required masks um, and things of that nature, but COVID is still here. Mm -hmm. um, and so protecting him was, in my eyes, the best way to do it by vaccinating him to at least reduce his severity of the disease, should he get it, which he did, um, and not cause hospitalization or worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it's good that you, you know, looked at his risk and said, oh, now he has a risk factor. He's at high risk. Yes. He has diabetes he needs to get vaccinated. Correct. Um, so that makes a whole lot of sense. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, Black people involved in the clinical trials. A lot of times we're, we're looking at the trial data or, you know, and we're we are often wondering, were there Black people included? Because we want to know. Were there. Them <laughs> so we can figure out. Is it going to help us too? So do you know about how many people were included in Pfizer's trial for this? Um, yes. Yeah, so out of the 2,200 on average patients, about 5% of the patients were of African-American descent. Okay. So 2,200 patients studied, 5% were Black. And then when you look at the COVID vaccines. That's um, actually 110 African Americans out of the 2200 patients. Okay. Okay. So 110 people which were which accounted for about 5% of yeah. um 5% of the total po population. Correct. Who of the study participants. Yes. Okay. All right. All right, cool. So I wanted just to compare that to um, the percentage of Black people that participated in the vaccine clinical trials. Um, I know that there were there were so many people. So if you look at the trial for pa Paxlovid, it was 2,200 people. And when you look at the clinical trials for the vaccines, um, Moderna had um, like, and I don't, know these numbers all the top of my head, but it was a lot. It was like, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 people. Yeah. Um, Pfizer had the same 20 or 30,000 people. So they have like tens of thousands of people in the studies. The pill has 2,200, like 2,000 <laughs> people in the study. And the um, vaccine trials had about... Um, 10%, I think it was 10% or more of the population was Black. So twice as many as were involved in um, compared to the the pills yes. study. So, so many more people in general, so many more Black people. And so if you're, if you're considering what information we have and the the data that's available is more black people in the 
vaccine trials and it's more people in general, many more people in general. So I want us to start to think about things like that, you know, so it's not just um, I'm not getting it or I don't want to do it um, because it's not enough information. Now we have something to compare it to because now you can look at the pill or you can look at the vaccine. And when you compare them to each other, there's more information on the vaccine than there is for the pill. And, it, and it's, it's nothing wrong with that. That is what it is, but it can help you to guide which one, if you had to pick one or the other, which one would you feel more comfortable doing if you care about what the science is? That's so absolutely kind of correct. Um, I want to add lip to that. So I'm um, comparing the side effects um, if you will, with this new medication, which right now they're, from what the data shows of those 2,200 patients is limited, maybe 1% of the patients might have high blood pressure, 3% of the patients might have some uh, diarrhea or stomach aches, um, only 1% had some muscle aches when they took um, Paclovid. But remember that that was a very small group of people. So the more and more patients that they test, the more um, that they give the medication to, the more amount of patients you're going to see with side effects. Or it could stay the same. But the thing is that we just don't know. With the COVID vaccines, we, we do know. Um, and that's one of the things that one of the reasons why people were hesitant in the beginning um, when they were getting the vaccines or at least offering them. We found out later that Johnson and Johnson had some issues with the um, clots that it that it caused. And so we backed away from that vaccine. And that was over time and over more patients that we found out this information. We really haven't had that time with this new medication pack with it at all yet. Yep, it's true. And I'm glad that you brought up um, the side effects, because when you look at the um, side effects of the pill, um, the it's, they, it's way more common than the say, side effects of the vaccine. So I looked at a study that, to, that highlighted what, how often did people report, um, the say, side effects of the vaccines. And again, these numbers are going to be low because this is what people reported the, themselves or with their healthcare providers reported. So they're low, but it's still good to know what were people saying and how, how they were feeling. Yeah. So when we looked at, um, and this was a study that was done from January 1st to April 30th of 2021. This is from last year. So when you look at the common side effects reported from the vaccines, it was headache, chills, fever, and pain at the injection site. For a lot of those, the frequency was 0.1% to zero point to point one percent super super low i believe zero one percent to point one percent that's that's very very low and this is studying um 240 million doses 240 million wow. doses and headache happened in point one point zero one percent that's like it didn't happen really but again this is probably I say underreported because these are, you know, people have to go into the system and report it and this paperwork and this time and technology. And if you don't have access to time or computers or paperwork to um, to report. submit to the VIR system, you know, it's not captured. But generally speaking, the side effects of the vaccines have been very, very mild. And the extreme side effects like the um, allergic reaction or the clot um, has been very, very, very rare. So take that into consideration too. Um, did you have something to add, Dr. Jones? 
Um, no, not at all. I actually have a funny story about that. Um, because we're not reporting it as you know as much as we would hope to, you can actually ask your friends and family that have gotten the vaccine, like how was it? Um, use them as a reference. Um, some people might say that they were tired or you know they felt achy. Some people, like my daughter, she she's nine. She got the vaccine, and I told her when I got it, my arm hurt. So the first day, she was like, "Oh my gosh, I can't move my arm. I need help," you know. And then like we got home and. You know, 20 minutes later, she's like playing uh, tennis. So what happened to your arm? Oh, it stopped. You know, so, <laughs> um, the, the side effects of the vaccine um, are nothing that me as a pharmacist is concerned with when compared to the risk of um, actually acquiring COVID um, and what can happen. Remember, it, it's COVID is not just something that can affect me personally or you personally, but it also affects the loved ones around you that you come in contact with. When we go home, we tend to take off our masks. We can't wait. Um, and now we're exposing those people. So um, the vaccine definitely has been studied and the side effects are minimal. Thanks for sharing. Jazzy funny. She said, I can't move my arm. <laughs> <laughs> Help me brush my teeth. <laughs> she's funny. She's funny. So um, I want to go back to drug interactions. Um, so that's a big deal. So do we worry about drug interactions with the vaccines at all? I don't ever remember it being a thing. Um, actually, we don't even worry about vaccines when we're giving them with other vaccines. You can't give certain sure. vaccines at the same time. Yeah, that's true. But other than that, we vaccinate everyone um, as long as it's age appropriate and dosed appropriately. There's no drug interactions. Um, the same cannot be said for Paclovid, though. Um, it does have some interactions. And before you go you know to just freely get this prescription especially from an urgent care or something like that you want to make sure that the person knows which medications you are on there's certain medications that um you can take this medication paclovid and it'll cause your other medications concentrations to go really high um and that can cause side effects. Some of those medications, for example, are Xanax. Some people use that for anxiety or to calm down. Um, that would make your Xanax dose feel like you get, got a lot larger dose um, and you don't want the side effects from that. Some people on heart medications, um, they're on blood thinners like Eliquis or Xarelto. Um, they can make those medications work too well and cause a bleeding issue. So you definitely want to know about the side effects or about the drug interactions and, and talk to your pharmacist or your doctor. Good point. Um, so again, um, these are things that we want you to always be considering when you, you know, are deciding what to do, how to keep yourself healthy. If you want the vaccine, if you want the pill, we just trying to give you some things to consider so that you can make the best decision for yourself. I saw that Lakeisha had a question that popped up on the screen, but I didn't get a chance to read the question. Can we bring that question back? And I also wanted to um, mention that Justin had wanted us to clarify that patients that take biologics like monoclonal antibodies um, should avoid taking live say vaccines, which is very true. So that so then I guess that is like a drug interaction to yeah. a vaccine, but the COVID vaccines are not live vaccines. Um, and we could talk about live and dead vaccines on another show. <laughs> We're almost out of time. And I'm waiting to see Lakeisha question. All right. So we're going to move along, um, see if I get the, if I get it popped up. And if not, girl, I'm going to just try to call you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Would you recommend consulting with your medical provider prior to vaccinating? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Especially if you trust your healthcare provider, um, always, you know, talk to him or her about the healthcare decisions that you're making help them to let you weigh what's the best thing because they know you and they know your medical history and all the medications you're taking. Um, so absolutely do that. Um, so I guess just to close out, 
Dr. Can I Jones. mention one more thing? Before? Oh, yeah. I did forget the probably the most important thing. Um, if you do ch choose to take a uh, pack with it, one of the things you have to remember is that you have to take it within five days of mm -hmm. your symptom onset. So if you miss that window, um, there's no data on if it works anymore um, at all. So that's one of the things that you have to be concerned about with the pill. Some people, when we feel like we have a little runny nose or so you know we kind of just ignore it um but that could be an onset of your symptoms if you god forbid got covid thanks for adding that thanks for adding that um um so i was going to ask you you know so just kind of looking at what you know about the pill and what you know about the vaccine in general if you were going to talk to someone who had not been vaccinated yet what would you say about them getting the pill versus the vaccine? Um, well, if they truly wanted to choose one of the two options, I would probably, t I will tell them that I think it's safer for them to be vaccinated. Um, there's multiple reasons, one of which you brought up, the length of time it's been studied, the number of patients that's been studied, the way it's been studied in African-Americans compared to the pill formulation of it, um, but also that you're being proactive. So you are, in essence, if you do are exposed to COVID, you know that for most, well, for the most of the mutations that we know of thus far, at least most, it does protect us against contracting the virus and spreading it to our loved ones. The rate of spreading it once you're vaccinated is extremely low compared to if you wait until you get COVID and then spread it and then take the medication to lower your risk of hospitalization or severe infection. Um, so I would always recommend the vaccine first. Again, there's things that are occurring on a day-to-day -day basis. Right now, the Florida general surgeon um, is not recommending the vaccine for children between five um, and 12 years old. We're waiting to see what science that goes off of. Um, but if you had to choose one, I would definitely choose the vaccinated approach. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I greatly appreciate it. I see my best friend. Hi. I know. I don't get to see you. You're all the way down south. We'll be back one of these days. Yes. <laughs> all right, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you next Wednesday at 1215. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.